Well, tonight, um, I listened to what everybody was talking about, and, and, and it was kind of like the Lord who impressed on me to talk about building trust with Him. Over the last couple weeks, there's been messages that have been preached when I kind of uh, took a break here for a couple weeks. The messages that have been being preached, I'm thinking, we have to learn how to... My thing is, like, if I go to church and I hear something, I want to be able to apply it to my life. So I want it to be practical. I want it to have a practical application. It's like, I love hearing a good message, but now what can I do with it? How can I take it beyond these walls? How can it, how can it get inside my soul? How can I meditate on this? And what am I meditating on? I'm not the one with the big words. I don't got them. So I just try to be practical when I'm teaching, and I let the Lord try to speak through me. So, um, But one thing I find in my day-to-day -day operations that now more than now more than ever before humanity has a trust problem everywhere I go when I'm dealing with people it seems like that relationships are being hurt or they're not increasing because of trust I mean the basic foundation of a relationship is trust what I try to tell uh, staff all the time is like, we're in a relationship. My employees at work, we're, we're in a relationship, you know? You're in a relationship with everybody around you. But if we don't have trust, we're in trouble, right? When you get to the root of it, it's trust that is the meat and potatoes of a relationship. Listen, all throughout your life, you will have very unproductive relationships if you have these trust problems. It's not going to work. There's no doubt about it. If we take it a step further, the most important relationship is the relationship of all relationships, right? Maybe it's not, maybe it's not your wife, you know. I'm talking about the relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's your most important relationship. I'm not telling you to put your family on the back burner, but what I'm telling you is everything will be so much better in your life if your relationship with God is good. If you're working on your relationship with him daily, we need to be able to trust him. If we're not capable of trusting God, how is his promise is going to be able to come to fruition in your life? Without trust, we won't believe that he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We won't believe that he's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. It's probably, it'll probably be a little difficult to take your relationships with him seriously. You got to throw out scriptures that say, uh, place all your trust in him. Throw that out if you ain't trusting him. Right. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. That's got to go. Because <laughs> you don't trust him. If we don't trust God, acknowledging him in everything you do is not going to work. It's going to be difficult to wrap your heads around the simple fact that he is just simply the God of all creation. Yes. Mm -hmm. One thing I like to do when I talk to people I'm like, okay, they want to you know, tell, me, tell me their problems or situations or ask for my advice. And I, I try to say one thing. What is the root of it? we got to get to the root of it. What is the root of it? What's the actual problem that we're trying to discuss? That's what I try. What is the circumstance here? And the nuts and bolts of it, what is the root of it? I don't know why he doesn't like you and you don't like him, but what's the root of the problem? I don't know why God doesn't answer your prayers all the time the way you think you should. I honestly cannot tell you why good things happen to bad people, right? That's a huge question. If there's a God, why do good things happen to bad people? We have scriptures for that. We have scriptures to comfort people in the, for, with those types of things. Like we say, God's ways are higher than our ways, right? That's scripture. That's an easy one to throw out. Ultimately, in those hard times, though, you're going to have to trust God more than ever before. Right. That's when we need to trust God the most in those hard times. I don't know why people don't get financially ahead. I can, I, I mean, I, I can look, you know, I can say, hey, you're, you're blowing money on lunch every day. You know, that could be a reason. But what's the root of it? Or what's your objective? Or what's your purpose? What, what is your situation? What do you really want out of this? But it's important to find out that when you're on this faith journey with Christ, you've got to start asking yourself the right questions. Sometimes when you get to the root of the stuff and when it boils all down to it, it's like, do you really straight up even believe in God? Do you? Do you believe that there's a God in heaven? Or do you trust God? 
Do you trust God? We need to learn how to build our trust in God. I mean, think about it for a second. Do you really trust the people around you? Do you really trust the government? Do you trust the voting process? <laughs> Do you trust your boss? I know Julie does. <laughs> Do you trust your husband or your wife? I'm telling you, if you learn to trust God, all these other relationships will get better. There's no promise, but you're going to put God at the forefront of everything when you trust him. So now when you're talking about living a Christ-filled life and you're trusting God for all things, the relationship with your wife will get better. The relationship with your husband will get better. The relationship with your co-workers will get better. I mean, you got to find, you gotta, this is a fact, I'm going to tell you right now. Living in the world right now, it is full of cheating, lying, stealing, compromise. Consistent breaches of trust all across society. Yes. Yeah. Social media, mainstream media. Right before our very eyes, they have taken the moral compass and they flipped it upside down. I know I say that a lot. But this has happened. And it's instituted a huge trust problem in society. I think it's safe to say humanity is, is in trouble when it comes to trust. Yes. If you would allow me, I'm going to try to have God use me to help me uh, talk through me to come to the conclusion that if you build the trust with your creator, if you build trust with God, then it's going to increase your faith tremendously. Amen. It's going to help you on your day-to-day -day walk every day. Yes. And through that increased relationship with him, your day-to-day -day lives are going to be better. Amen. Let's pop. Father, I pray, God, that your hand will be upon me, Lord. Right now, Lord, I want to be able to deliver the word you gave me with truth, God, I want to be able to deliver it, get out of, out of the way, God. I pray, Jesus, that you would work through me, God, that I would just be a vessel. I would not get in the way. I pray for the soil, that what is being spoken would fall on good hearts. People can take it, apply it, God, and we can grow from it, Lord. This is your word and your word only. I do not want to corrupt it, Father God. Yes. Have your hand upon us. In your name we pray. Amen, amen. 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 The definition of trust is firm belief in the reliability of Truth, ability, or strength of someone or something. I'm going to use Gideon as an example. The other day I woke up at my normal time to pray, and I got out of bed, and I was taking out my retainer, because I got to wear a retainer every night. And I was putting on my chocolates, <laughs> and I said, man, God, who should I use as an example this week? I was really thinking Abraham, and the Lord said, Gideon. And me, knowing better than God, I said, stuck with the Abraham, right? <laughs> I'm thinking, God, Gideon is a man of great faith, but how does it apply to trust? So I stuck with Abraham. I talked to my dad. I even told him, yeah, I'm going to be talking about Abraham this week. And then I talked to my sister, the little prophetess, apostle woman. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, Dave, I don't know what it is this week, but God's really taking me back to Gideon. And I'm like, okay, maybe I'll just use Gideon. <laughs> but that settled it for me. Like, I know the voice of God. I can hear it. Uh, I don't have to go back and forth or go over it a billion times. I know what God said. She confirmed it, so we're going with Gideon, okay? So we're going to read through the first, the two, the two chapters, but I'm going to break it down. We're going to start in Judges 6, 1 through 4. And I'm reading in the ESV version. The people of Israel did what was, e what was evil in the sight of the Lord. You're going to find something in the Old Testament. This is a huge phrase that's used over and over and over and over. The Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. So here we see yet again the people of Israel done evil in the sight of the Lord. Turn their backs on God, right? And to the point of where the Lord says, here you go, you want that sin, have it. God will do that. He'll give you to yourself. He says, here you go, if you want to fall into sin so much, here, have it. Have more of it. You want to buy eight dogs, here, let me give you a ninth for free. You know, go ahead. So God gave them into the hands of Midian at this point, right? For seven years, continuing on. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and caves and the strongholds. So think about that. 
the strength of Midianites, the Israelites hid themselves in the dens and the mountains and the caves. They were hiding. They were scared. They turned their back on God. They knew what they had done. They weren't putting their trust in him anymore. So what they decided to do was hide. But this is what they chose for themselves. They knew that once you step outside of the will of God, they knew, oh, you know what? We got to hide. We in trouble. Continuing on, for whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel, no sheep or ox or donkey. So anything the Israelites did, the bullies came up and they pumped them. They were like, give me all this stuff. Give me this. No ox, no sheep, no nothing. Now, they done evil in the sight of the Lord. Right? Mm -hmm. Now watch what happens. And Israel was, continuing on in verse 6, <clears throat> and Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Hey, when the going gets tough, what do we do? Jesus! But usually you say, why have you forsaken me? He's like, no, 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 no. This is all your decisions and your choices, right? Whenever I read the Old Testament, I can see myself in a lot of this stuff, right? We're always, you know, going through life and we make a poor decision and we're like, oh, I messed up. How did I get to this point? You can't compile those bad decisions, you know what I mean? Get back to the throne of grace when you start making bad choices. You're not going to be perfect, man. You better understand something. It's, this world is tough. This life is hard. If you make bad choices, get on your knees. Lord, forgive me. Get, get, get me back on track. But they were saying, Lord, I screwed up. I need you. They eventually got to the point where they're crying out to him again. I'm skipping down to verse 10. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the God of the Amorites in whose, in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Shocker. Somehow their disobedience led them to doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Is that crazy? I find it very hard to believe that a God-fearing, faithful, obedient child of the king can go from this follower, obedient person, to all of a sudden, you're some evil-doing reject that God doesn't want you anymore. Just like that. And God says, you're cooked. Into the Midianites you go. No, I find that hard to believe. But what he's saying is, you did not obey my voice. So the Lord showed me something. They lost track of their relationship with Christ. Yes. Follow me. They couldn't hear his voice anymore to obey it. They couldn't pick his voice out amongst the noise. How can you trust and obey God if you can't hear him or even pick out his voice? Do you think they were deliberately being disobedient for fun's sake? It's like, oh, I'm not listening. No. They weren't being deliberately or disobedient. They somehow got to a place where God's voice was being drowned out in their lives. Our lives can get to a place where we are so distracted by the noise around us that there's so much clutter. Yeah. Come on. That's good. Our to-do list sometimes gets too great mm -hmm. or too important mm -hmm. that we don't have time to even think. I believe society tries to fill your mind with something every single second of your day to distract you. Yes. Yeah. Our minds, our consciousness is being so spun in different directions, we don't even have time to decompress. We come to the conclusion that watching TV is decompression. It can even be our worries, our bitterness. Our bitterness can be so loud it can distract us from the voice of God. Yes. Our anger, our sadness, our fear, our hurts, our physical pain. Your physical pain in your body can be so much that it distracts the voice of God. Your emotional pain. I mean, your children can get in the way of the voice of God. Because you're so busy raising them and doing life with them. Your grandchildren. Because somehow some of us ended up raising our children's children. And that can be so busy 
But now you're like, I just got to make sure this kid gets it right. Because I don't know what I did with that kid, but this kid ain't going to fall through those same cracks. Does entertainment drown out the voice of God? Our business or our jobs? Our kids' sports? Sometimes I truly believe our daily thinking can be so loud that God's voice don't even stand a chance. If you guys all started yelling in here at the same time, I don't care how loud I put this mic, you ain't going to hear me. The first key to building trust is we need to have a clear mind and a clear conscience to hear God. How can you hear someone if you don't take the time out to sit and listen? We need to hear his voice. Yes. In Romans it says faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. Our faith will be increased in knowing and hearing his voice. The only way to recognize who God truly is is through his word. If we do not take conscious time and effort to be in this Bible, we will have a difficult time understanding the voice of God. Amen. Ultimately, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Sheep is a very basic level of knowing God's voice. A sheep. It's a beginning stage. A beginning stage of trust will allow you an opportunity to obey his voice. If hearing and knowing his voice is available to all of us, we need to make sure we do our best to eliminate some of those noises. A guy I follow, his name is Marcus, he posted something the other day, and it said, don't get directions from someone that is lost. Mm. That's good. There are even well-meaning voices around us, like friends or relatives, who can unintentionally drown out the voice of God in your life. We can't let them. Just like I started this message, when I was taking out my retainer, putting on my chocolates, my ears are ready to hear. That is the time I set apart with God, an intentional time. It's our time together. So ultimately, when we need to take these necessary steps and eliminate the noise around us, we need to find an opportunity and set it aside for God. Yes. In the beginning of my journey, I was focusing on hearing the voice of God so much I could hear him in a crowded room. I mean, I, I was eating it up. I could hear God in a crowded room. That's all I wanted. Because it was the beginning. It was pure ignorance. I had no idea. I just wanted more. And that's what God does in the beginning stages of your relationship with him. He'll give you more and more and more. You're so ignorant to, to, to what's going on around you. You're like, no, I don't care what nobody says. God told me, so I'm doing it. Yeah. And they're like, well, there's red tape. There's... There's politics. There's protocol. You can't. What? God told me this. I'm not listening to you guys. New believers of the Lord can go rogue. Yeah. <laughs> because God has just opened up their eyes to so much. Yes. I was in Disney World. And I was, it was a parade going on and it was crazy. This was Carter was a baby. And right in the middle of the parade, I could hear God, God said, I love each and every one of these people. There were so many people around, and I was like, wow, God. That stuck with me to the day. We were at Sierra, and we were checking out at the line, and the lady was talking to Jenny, and I could, I could just, like, God loves this woman, you know. If, if you could keep this stuff at the forefront, it's going to help you witness. It's going to help you be... It's going to help you be the Christ that you're trying to be, that people can see Jesus in you and through you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Listening to preaching is not the only way to get the word of God. Right. We need to read it. Amen. We have to understand something, that right now we are also in a dispensation of deception. There's so much deception going on inside the world, you don't know who to believe. Right. The best way to consume the word of God is through reading it yourself. Right. If you get it from someone else and you're only listening to someone else, they can take the Bible out of context. Yeah. That's why when I try to do sermons, I try to put a lot of scripture in it. Because I ain't got nothing good to say, man. Listen to the word of God. Right. Because anybody can take a scripture and flip it and change the context, move a comma. <coughs> Let's get back to the story. Yeah. Judges 6.11 now the angel of the Lord came you got that, and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon was beating out 
wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So in enters Gideon. Mind you, he's hiding the work he's doing because he doesn't want to get bullied, right? He's hiding. We need to remember something. In the Old Testament, God always worked through prophets, mighty men. That's what he did. That was, that was the thing. Now, each one of us, we are those mighty men now, okay? Yes. When the veil was torn, when Jesus died on the cross and he rose again, you have direct access to Christ yourself. Yes. Yes. There doesn't have to be a mediator. There doesn't have to be a prophet now. Amen. So you can put yourself in Gideon's shoes right now because we're in a different spot. Make no mistake, God is tugging on you every single day. Amen. Because God has a purpose and God has a plan for your life. Yes. You need to believe that. God chose you for something. Yes. Back to the scripture. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, Now this is the angel of the Lord talking to Gideon. The Lord is with you, almighty man of valor. The guy who's hiding, right? He's talking him up. right? Trying to speak life to him. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where all is his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us? Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of the Midianites? What? Here we go again. There's that victim spirit, that victim mentality. I point to some of it all the time because we got so many victims in this world. Something happened at Carter School and, and, and the principal lady is like, well, we're going to talk to all the kids. I said, no, you don't need to talk to all the kids. Why? So all the kids can know that uh, uh, Carter said something and now he's going to be a victim in the circumstance. Like, oh, boy, oh, boy, something feels so bad for you. No, man, we ain't no victim. He got, he got bullied. He got teased. Big deal, he'll get over it. We can't walk around with this victim mentality. No. I'm telling you right now, God has not called you to be a victim. Amen. God has not called you to place blame. God has called you to stand up and Amen. be a child of the king. Yes. And it's crazy to me to see what's going on with Gideon is because God is calling him for something greater. Yes. And Gideon is hiding mm -hmm. and he's a victim. Mm -hmm. Come on. Mm -hmm. But guess what? He has to build his trust. Yes. And that's what he's doing. Don't sing the blues now, Gideon. Y'all were disappointed, dis disobedient to the voice of God. That's why you got here. Because the voices all around you started to diminish the voice of God in your life. Maybe we stopped spending some attentional time with Christ then. Right. That's why I couldn't hear him. Listen, I'm going to tell you guys something right now. Even a compass will lose its way when it's around magnets. Think about it. Back to the scripture. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. So this dude was just complaining. He was just whining. He's a victim. He's hiding. Now God's telling them, You're going to save him. <laughs> Do not I send you, Gideon? Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. So the Lord's telling him, dude, I got a plan for you, Gideon. I'm going to have you go. You're going to lead these guys to safety. And he's like, I'm the ugly duckling. I come, I come from the hood, man. My, my clan is weak. And the Lord said to him, but I will be with you. Amen. And you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Here's Gideon speaking. And he said to him, if now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that is you who speaks to me. So now, Gideon is starting to trust a little bit. But he's like, okay, I'm going to do it. But show me a sign first, please. <laughs> I tell you guys this all the time. Before I started this church in my basement, I wanted that airplane to go across <laughs> with the banner. And that was going to be, there it is. He needs a sign. I'm not mad at Gideon. Look, I, we all do that. We all need a sign sometimes. I, we won't read through those scriptures, but Gideon goes ahead and he brings back some broth and he brings back meat and unleavened cake and he sets it down there and the angel of the Lord touches it and poof, it disappears. And he disappears. Poof, gone. 
So then it says in 6.22, it says that Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace be to you, do not fear, you shall not die. So he believes. He said, Do not fear, you shall not die. Here God knows Gideon believes now. Gideon's eyes are open. Gideon's believer is now being fixed. His believer's working again. Okay, I see it. So the first thing God does is he provides provision. He says, don't be afraid. You're not going to die. Amen. So do you see, as you start trusting God, God's like, hey, don't worry. I got you. Right, right. Your wife, she's going to come to me. Don't worry. God is going to start supplying provision for all of your needs as soon as you start to build trust in him. Right. Don't fear. You're not going to die. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it the Lord is peace. Amen. Gideon is now aware of the Lord's voice. He's convinced of who Christ is, knowing the voice of his creator, and now he builds an altar. Mm -hmm. Key number two, build an altar. Amen. Prayer is the only way to develop your relationship with Christ. Consistent lines of communication and an altar is a key component to our growth and our relationship with him. I tell my wife all the time, baby, you got a deeper relationship with Christ than a lot of people. She does. How? How? how because I see you get up and talk to God every day. Amen. If you're talking with God every day, God knows you. He knows you by name. The Bible says he's going to say your name. I'm going to give you a little public service announcement too. If you communicate in all of your relationships, they will be better. Amen. <laughs> Two-sided though. Not just one-sided. But seriously, we need to have open lines of communication in all of our relationships, everywhere we go. We have to understand we're in a relationship with everybody. This is what I'm telling you. I, I, I tell my employees, I'm like, dude, this is a one-sided relationship. You ask me for something, I give it to you, and you give me nothing. It's one-sided. Right? We can't be like that with God. We can't only ask, ask, ask. We've got to be able to listen. We've got to set aside intentional time to speak with Him. So now we're reading our word, we're talking to God, we're communing with Him, we're setting down, and we're praying. We need to spend intentional, uninterrupted time with God. At the early stages of my newfound relationship with Christ, I started to get up at 5.30 in the morning to pray. I know I've said this time and time again. Maybe I'm saying it because maybe I want y'all to try it. I know it's a sacrifice. Trust me, I know it's a sacrifice. But I've gotten the roller coaster of not getting up, kind of getting up, praying with one foot out of the bed. I've done all that. That's, that's old news now. I get up. Right? Do I get up? Because you know what? There's a couple times where I did it, and God said, how are you going to fight? I jumped out of bed. It's like, you're right. Whew. Thank you, Lord. I needed that. Because you know what? I can't do it on my own. By the time I get to work, I got 18 problems to deal with, and I'm like, I got to be prayed up, man. I got to have that Holy Spirit operating in me. So I'm up. Now, the weekends is harder. Because my family's there and they infiltrate all the personal space. <laughs> but that's okay. We find the, you know, we try to find ways and sneak and hide, you know. But I've done this for 12 or 13 years and I'm telling you, if you start a practice of this in your life, oh, your life is going to be so transformed. Amen. Yes. It's tough, man. It's tough. But I'm telling you, God sees it. As I prepared for this ministry, I had no idea what was to come. And you know what? This is when COVID started, back in 2020. And God told me, I want you to start a prayer group. I said, okay. I received that. What do you want me to do? I didn't really know what to do. So I didn't do nothing. A week goes by, two weeks goes by. God said, I want you to start a prayer group. If you don't do it, I'm going to use somebody else. So I was like, okay. I texted all my friends. Group chat, group text to all my friends. I have a group text with all my friends and their, and their wives. Hey guys, we're going to start to pray at 8.30 every night. That's all I did. 
Forwarded that text to all my friends. Okay, we're going to couple with you. We're all going to pray. Remember, we were all locked in during COVID. We were all locked in. So 8.30 every night, everybody's praying. All of a sudden, I got people texting me. Hey, we're going to pray at 8.30. Did you want to join us? I'm like, sure. I didn't say I started it. But, <laughs> but I was like, wow, this is incredible. Finally, we got to the point where I heard there was like 180 people praying at 8.30 at night. It was on Facebook. People were getting together 8.30 at night. Everybody's praying. And God's like, see? See? In prayer, I can move mountains. Unity is built through prayer. After that happened, I ended up having a, a, a prayer group with all my friends in my basement. We did once a month, maybe? Was that once a month? Something like that. And we were praying downstairs in the basement right where we started the church. That's pretty cool, man. We prayed down there, and all of a sudden we started a church down there. So, I mean, that's, that's legit. That's like, hey, and I didn't think if we pray down here, then a church, no, that never came to me. But now when I look back, I can look at the sequences and say, man, God, I built my trust in you, and you orchestrated every step of the way. Right, right. Amen. Had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with me obeying his voice. Yes. Because he told me, if you ain't going to do it, somebody else will. Right. I'm so lost. <laughs> yeah, this is good. Yeah, you're right. But I'll tell you something. As you start to build trust with God, and as you start this, this is where the breadcrumbs start to happen. Yes. It's like Jesus gives you a breadcrumb here and a breadcrumb there. Things start to happen. It's like a huge puzzle that God is putting together. And it's you walking it, you talking it, but God's like, what about this one? Okay. What about this? I mean, your whole world becomes shaken, flip your whole script upside down. You can't even explain it to people. They're going to think you're you're crazy. But you know what ends up happening? Is you start attaining what I call it this God confidence. And you can walk in that God confidence and you can go through different circumstances that don't turn out the way they should and they don't have a moral to the story and you're still feeling good. Amen. You're like, I get it. God must have allowed that to happen to me for a reason. I don't yes. know. Right. Yes. I lost my job, right, Julie? Oh, well. God must have took it away from me. Girl, you're buying a house. I don't know. <laughs> Amen. For Gideon, he was so worried that God wanted to do something miraculous that Gideon was scared he wasn't going to be able to do it. But he just needed 100% confidence that the Lord was going to be with him. So what Gideon starts to do is he starts to fleece God. A fleece is basically kind of testing God. That's what it is. I've read and I heard so many different commentaries about fleecing God, and a lot of people think you shouldn't do it. Some people think you should. Do whatever you see is fit. But here's the key. God wanted Gideon to do something great, and Gideon didn't believe he could do it, so God had to prove himself to Gideon. Right. So if God did that for Gideon, and it's in the book, I think God would do that for you. Amen. Amen. Yes, he will. So early on in our relationship with Christ, if you need your, you need your faith strengthened, do some stuff. Amen. Sam's got a great story. Jenny's got a great story. You know, Jenny talked about some dark chocolate. I told you guys this story, right? Yep. Jenny said, Lord, have somebody bring me dark chocolate. And my parents brought her dark chocolate from Disney World. Six pieces of the most expensive dark chocolate you can find. And she's like, you're not going to believe this. I can't believe this happened. I'm like, I believe it because I know God is true. I know God is faithful. I know God answers your prayer. And I go, God will answer your fleece if you put it before him. Because if he did it today, then he's going to do it today. Yes. Yes. Amen. I heard so many testimonies of people fleecing God. Let's read it. Judges 6. Then Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, right? As you have said, Lord, I am laying a fleece alone, a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on the ground all around, then I shall know that you will save Israel by his hand, by, by hand, as you have said. And it was so. Next day, when he rose early the next morning, he squeezed out this fleece. He wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl of water. But check this out. Gideon is probably a lot like me and you. He says, 
Let not your anger burn against me, Lord, but I'm going to try this again. One more time. Please let me test you. Let it be dry on the fleece only and on the ground all around. Let there be dew this time. And God did so that night and it was dry on the fleece only and all the ground there was dew. God answered Gideon's fleeces. Amen. So Gideon was now all in. There's growing pains in our relationship with Christ. There's trials. There's testing. But, the, but there's no way to build trust without actually trusting God. Amen. What I was trying to say is there's a story here. I'm going to read it. I, I got an employee, right? She's worked with us for about 15 years. Okay. She's an incredible employee. And we had a supervisor position come available. And she comes up to me and she says, hey, I have an idea. What about this girl for the supervisor position? I didn't see it. I was like, uh-uh, no way, no how, in my head. But I had built up enough trust in her that I said, okay, let's try it. That girl's a supervisor today. She was right. But the reason why I listened to her was because I built up trust with her. And that's what I'm trying to show you. Is that if you build up trust with God, you pull, build up trust and you put these fleeces and God answers them and you get these trials and God sees you through them, you are going to do something greater. Right. Yes, That's yes. It. Here's key number three. Stay faithful. Remain loyal and steadfast. All throughout your relationship with Christ, you need to remain faithful. What can God, what God can and will do through you ultimately depends on your faithfulness. It ultimately depends on you keeping on, keeping on. Amen. In closing, the last passage of scripture I want to read through is the impossible part. The miracle. The incredible miracle that happened through Gideon. Amen. Let's read it. Corey's got it in seven. The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Because Israel may boast over it. So God said, I got too many people going with you, Gideon. We're going to have to, to, to dwindle this down a little bit because I don't want you guys to think you were overpowering them. I'm going to have a miracle, but I want it to be my way. Amen. So just trust me. Yeah. But since he built trust with him already, Gideon was okay with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from the Mount Gilead. So all the people who were there, he was like, dude, if you guys are afraid, get out of here. Then 22,000 of the people left. <laughs> that was cool, right? So we good, Lord? 22 left. We only got 10,000 10, people left. And the Lord said, the people are still too many. Take them down to the water. I'm going to test them there for you, Gideon. Anyone to whom this one shall go with you shall go with you. And anyone whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water. Now he's going to tell them. The Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink and the number of those who lapped putting their hands to their mouths was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men whom lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites in your hand and let all the others go every man to his home. So the people who lapped like a dog, that was 300 people. He said, those are your people. The rest, they can go. 22,000 people left. Now you got 10,000 people. What is that, 9,000? I shouldn't be doing math up here. 9,700 people left. So there's 300 people left. That's not even the most incredible part about all of it. So the people took provisions in their hands and their trumpets. And he sent all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, but retained the 300. And the camp of Midian below, below him in, uh, and the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. And that same Lord, night, the Lord said, Arise, go down against the camp. For I have given it into your hand. So the Lord said, look, you're going to go up. You're going to go down there. I gave it to you. Trust me. Verse 16. And he divided the 300 men into three companies and put trumpets into their hands, all of them in empty jars with torches inside of them. 
Look at me and do likewise. When I come to the outskirts of the camp, do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me would then blow the trumpets also on every side of the camp and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. So he says, look, you're going to get a jar with fire in it and a trumpet. So he's going to take them to take over the Midianites with a jar and a trumpet? No weapons. That's incredible. It's got to be God. But that's why he had to build trust with Gideon to get to this process. Because what he was going to do to you is going to flip the script of so many people around you. They're going to be like, they did all that? With that little ghetto church in somebody's house? Yeah, that's right, we did. We trusted God. We followed his lead. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hand the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow. And they cried out, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. Every man stood in his place around the camp and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. When, the, when they blew the 300 trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade, against all the army. And the army fled. These guys killed themselves. They were confused. You guys can stand. Is that unbelievable? The biggest takeaway from this is here at the Remnant Church, our heartbeat is that you develop a relationship with Christ. That's what it is. My dad talked about warring against your flesh. And in order to combat your flesh and the enemy is you have to grow this deep relationship with Christ. You know, when you have a deep relationship with Christ, it's going to minimize the amount of setbacks. It's going to allow you to abstain from sin. It'll allow you the faith to bounce back when you do sin. It'll allow you the wonderful opportunity to produce good fruit. And at the end of every day, each one of you know, God has called you to do something greater. No matter how rich or poor or how educated you are, no matter how young you are in the Lord, remember Gideon. His relationship development with Christ resulted in something much greater simply from him learning the voice of God. Your relationship with God is going to keep you. I never want to come to a place where I'm so caught up in developing spiritually immature saints to fill the church. We're not going to do that. Here at the Remnant, we're committing to guiding folks to Christ. Jesus is our attraction. Not this building, not the experience on Sunday. Jesus' purpose was to draw men to himself. And he does that by using ordinary people like me and you and Gideon. This ain't no one man show. We're looking for you to develop your relationship with Christ so you can be used in the capacity that he sees you. The last key to building trust is timing. God's timing is perfect. And God's timing for you is just that. It's his timing for you. Not your timing for him. God knows our limits. God knows our heights. God knows our hearts. Trust the process. Trust his timing. Watch him fill in your blanks. If you let him, he will always dot all your I's and cross all your T's. There's a vast difference between relationship with religion and relationship with Christ. People can be so afraid to come to church or come to the house of God because they think it's met with rules and regulations. But that's religion. Relationship is met with love, God-fearing choices that you will make 
on a day-to-day -day basis once you know him more. God loves you. He desires a deep relationship with you. Create opportunities for you to know his voice. Create opportunities to you know his word. My goal has never been to have a thousand person church. My goal has always been to follow Christ and if that happens, that happens. I don't know. I don't know where the next step is. I don't know where to go next. But I know one thing, his presence is here. I know one thing, he's leading us, he's guiding us. I know one thing, each and every person in this room is eating up the word of God. That's all that matters. Jesus, I just want to say thank you, God.